games as long as I can remember. They're a core part of what makes me who I am. I believe there's this deeply rooted, often unstated mission of games to keep adventure alive. In 2014, Bungie set out to start a new adventure. Heroes awakened on a desolate planet, a silent god set in our sky. And it wouldn't be long before an ancient enemy shrouded in darkness showed up at humanity's door to destroy us. Over the years, our heroes would shape a story far greater than anything we could have imagined. Players would explore deep into the depths of Venus, hunting a machine god that controlled time itself. They'd invent ways to combine their mythic weaponry and their paracausal abilities to stand alone against monsters that took others, an entire elite squad. They'd race alongside their friends far into the early morning in the halls of an ancient city where only a select few emerged victorious at dawn, clutching the heart of a dragon. But most importantly, they'd bring their friends and their family into this world and together meet new faces on this adventure who would become lifelong companions. Now, together, we approach the final shape. We're about to embark on the last expedition of Destiny's first saga. So let's be clear about the stakes. In the final shape, you will go inside the Traveler. The journey will be difficult. And what awaits you on the other side of this trek is nothing less than the deadliest entity we have ever faced. There will be no open betas. There aren't gonna be any guides on the internet telling you how to handle what's to come. Whether you've been with us from the beginning, joined us somewhere along the road, or looking at Destiny for the first time, anybody who shows up on launch day is gonna be greeted with this same uncharted world, a vacuum sealed experience begging for you to be the first person to peel it open. So today is your invitation to go forth and adventure. After all these years, we never talked about it. Why I brought you back. Why you were chosen. truth is, I didn't know them. It was just a feeling. This is a momentous time in Destiny history. We've been building to this moment for the last 10 years. The final shape is the conclusion to that journey. This is a moment in gaming that as a developer, you just don't get very often. 
Guardians and allies are fighting the biggest threat that the universe has ever seen in this big culmination of the Light and Darkness saga. When we were thinking of what the final shape could be, it had to be a lot of different things. It needs to pay off this epic confrontation with the witness that we've been setting up for years. It has to bring you closer to your allies in the vanguard. It has to be this place that like makes you feel nostalgic for the entire journey you've been on. When we were resurrected by ghosts at the very beginning of this story, we didn't know why, but it was for this. The traveler is asking us for help and it's our responsibility to protect every living thing in the universe from what the witness intends to do. When we first start the final shape, we are finally able to go through the portal that the witness opened in the Traveler at the end of Lightfall. Inside is the pale heart of the Traveler. That is the stage for our showdown with the witness. The witness has the darkness. It has always had a connection to it. The pale heart of the Traveler is what it's trying to use to gain connection to the light. So with both, it can enact its final shape. The witness looks around and sees a lack of purpose, no meaning. It wants to fix all that. So it's trying to put the universe into this frozen perfection where everything's just exactly how it thinks it's supposed to be. That is the final shape. If we're gonna defeat the witness, it's going to take everyone. Failure is not an option. We're gonna need the Vanguard, all of our allies, and all the Guardians to rally together and be brave in the face of oblivion. In the final shape, we're going to answer questions at the grandest scale. But what I find really interesting is that it's also a very personal journey where we deepen our relationships with these characters that we've known for so long. Zavala, Ikora, our ghost get to reconnect with Cade Six. So like, while there's this great conflict and everything going on around us and stakes of just unimaginable heights, it's still at the end, a story told around campfires by a bunch of companions who have been fighting together for hundreds of years. In the final shape, we're going through the portal that the witness has opened up to confront it and stop the final shape. Inside the Traveler is this infinite, vast, unknowable Edward landing on the Pale Heart, which is a fraction of really what is inside the Traveler. The Pale Heart is weird. It's a little strange, it makes you feel a bit uncomfortable. And it is also just so cool and artistic in the best way. The Witness entered well ahead of any Guardians. And so it's had time to kind of shape what's there. When our Guardian enters, the rest of the Pale Heart starts getting shaped also around what we've experienced. This is the Traveler recreating the world in front of you as it saw on your journey. One of the most memorable locales from Destiny's past is the D1 Tower. It's really a labor of love from the Destiny team. The final shape means so much to everyone who's building it, and I think players are really going to be able to see that. The Pale Heart is our very first linear destination that we've ever done. I would love it if players felt that they began their journey in a place of safety and feel it escalate in danger, in surrealness, because there is this beautiful evolution of the space. They see things that are more and more wrong as they begin to go towards the Witness's monolith. It's kind of this omnipresent, foreboding thing off in the distance. The weirdest things happen as you get closer to the monolith in the form of reshaping kind of like deconstructing things and putting them back together, just wrong. The sense of scale you get out there, like as you're exploring these spaces and you're jumping on these reshaped cuboids of Earth, 
you feel tiny as a guardian. You feel alone. You feel like you are not the force to be reckoned with that you have been. You're not the god slayer right now. You're just this little person jumping from these massive pieces to massive pieces. One of the things that we really try to also capture is that the witness keeps throwing everything it has at you. And so you're going to fight these new enemies, the subjugators. Subjugators are the new unit you're going to be facing in the final shape. They have an enhanced power set. They're performing stasis powers and strand powers to face the Guardian, while in support of all the other enemies you're fighting too. They bring something entirely new to the battlefield, which is kind of this element of control. They're back there pinging away with stasis abilities, throwing crystals at you, freezing you in place, Ooh. tangling you up. We're focusing you on the campaign and only the campaign. It's the most important thing in the universe at that moment. You have to stop the final shape from happening. And for that, we do need the help with our allies. And so we're going to make sure that the core Vanguard team gets back together, Zavala and Ikora and Kate. The campaign is just the start of the Pale Heart. After you've reached the monolith and finished the campaign, we open up the entire destination. And so the entire Pale Heart is going to react to you and what you are doing. The campaign in the final shape doesn't really end with the final mission. The raids are where you defeat like the big bosses. So it's only natural that when you are going to confront the witness, you're going to do that in the raid. But that might not be enough. This is a moment where we need to rally all guardians to be able to overcome the final shape and the witness. In the final shape, we are inside the Traveler, very close to this energy. This allows us to have new supers, arc, solar, void. We want to create something that turns you into an offensive powerhouse, but also can benefit your allies in a support capacity. There is this thread of team play and like working with your friends to overcome the odds. The Warlock Super is this ultimate expression of solar energy coursing through your Guardian. This Solar Warlock Super is a callback to Radiance from D1. Other than Golden Gun, this is the only other first-person Super in Destiny right now. Your melees, oh, like all these, these projectiles going off, doubling the amount of projectiles. Your grenade almost being sentient as it searches around, and then it hits a character and bounces off and goes to another one. And you're so overflowing with this energy that you are also giving it to your allies, allowing them to have their solar weapons supercharged, applying Scorch when they're shooting. The new solar warlock aspect, when I cast my Rift, it is going to create this little solar soul that when it sees an enemy, it launches part of itself out and hits the enemy and explodes and scorches them. It just feels very alive. Twilight. Arsenal. <laughs> <laughs> it's a layered super. This is the only ranged one-off offensive super for Titans in the game. The Titan jumps up into the air, summons this giant void axe, throws it, summons another one, throws it, summons another one, looks at a different group of enemies, throws it. And when these axes fly through the air, they stick into the ground or an enemy, do their void gravity thing where they suck a bunch of energy and enemies in and then explode. But that doesn't destroy the axe. The axe sticks around and you and your allies can go and pick up that axe and start wailing on enemies with it. This super is insane to me. The Void Titan aspect, I press and hold my grenade button to consume my grenade and turn it into the shield. The more damage it takes, the more it charges up and then I can release that and it creates this blast that deals massive damage. The Hunter Arc Super. Arc is all about finding the shortest distance between two points. The Hunter kind of rears back, takes this knife and throws it across the world. 
and then is able to blink to its position, do the slash that just decimates anyone nearby. One really great thing about that is not just you do it once, but you're able to do it three times, along with devastating attacks each time you do it. The Hunter has an aspect. We take our staff, we twirl it in the air, which propels us upward. It creates this burst, which amplifies you and any allies near you. It almost makes it feel like you're playing a fighting game, right? Like these combos that you're chaining together to do these different moves. It, it like takes that, that sandbox to the next level. The more aspects we have, the more capable we are to do that. It feels like you're like riding the lightning, you know? Like that instantaneous, like... That was good, but I think it's more like... <laughs> You know? I like it, I like it. Weapons team has been working on all sorts of goodness. We've got exotics, we've got legendaries, we've got perks. We're always cooking up stuff. We're always playing with stuff that we think is like really interesting or taking inspiration. We have Tessellation, which is this exotic pyramid fusion rifle. It has the really intriguing property of adapting your guardian's current damage type. This will be the first time that you can run a weapon that can adapt to be strand or stasis in the energy slot. So you'll be able to run an entirely strand or entirely stasis loadout. Tessellation has the additional property that you can special reload to uh, reshape your grenade and suck it into the weapon uh, and then fire out a super destructive single projectile. It's a really special weapon. What's the one specific exotic that I can make that's like really zany that you would like right now? What if Golden Gun was a sniper rifle? What if you could harness the, the might of the Traveler? You know, we had a moment where we saw that Traveler Beam cutscene. I know people on weapons went, I kind of want that. You're like, that is incredibly dope. So we've got this opportunity to bring back these iconic Destiny 1 weapons, but really turn it into something that feels unique in Destiny 2. We have to bring Kvastav into the fold. The Red Death exotic pulse rifle. And Dragon's Breath. Burn the world, burn it all. In the final shape, we have new weapon subfamilies coming, broadening what existing weapons can be. Really, like, bordering on exotic functionality. So, for example, we've got a rocket pistol sidearm subfamily. We always liked the special ammo sidearms. This fires tiny, slow-moving rockets. They hit very hard, do a bit of AOE damage. They have a mixture of regular weapon and rocket launcher stats. And we're also doing a new support weapon subfamily. The support frame auto rifle is a type of legendary auto rifle. It'll let you switch seamlessly from firing at enemies to healing your allies. I'm really excited to bring it to dungeons and keep my team alive, honestly. <laughs> The weapons team is always coming up with new ideas. We've got a ton of new cool stuff coming over the next few years and some new and really wild ideas, which we're pretty excited about. Come on, take a load off. We've got a lot to cover. This place is only big enough for one dashing hero type, and that's me, so... I'm back! Hey, you two, give me a sec. I was magnificent. This is great. Anyone want a hug? Get your rock off my map. Worst case scenario, you die. But who knows? Maybe you won't. Well, better get back to it. In this moment where we're driving to the end of the Light and Darkness saga, it's great to see Cade like return to this world at this moment with all this change about to culminate with this confrontation with the, the long-standing enemy, the Witness. Cade is the quintessential hunter. His presence casts such a long shadow over the story of Destiny, whether it was when he was alive or when he was dead. What Cade goes through mm -hmm. in this journey, how he serves as a catalyst for the other characters, the events that are uncovered to have brought him back. This is how the story had to end. There was no end to the Light and Darkness saga that didn't have Cade here alongside his friends to finish the job. Once we started digging into the nature of the Pale Heart, I think that crystallized Cade's role as a guide. Cade is Virgil, and he's our guide through this other place. 
Cade is the one who is the most appropriate person to be the guide, because that's his job. That's always been his job. It just feels so natural for Nathan to be back in the booth. It felt amazing to just see him slip back into the role, like, without missing a beat. Right, instantly. In the flesh, or metal, as it were. Cade's the glue that's always held Zavala and Ikora up together. Having him back puts them in a position of questioning where they've been and what they've done without him. You think about the journey that Zavala's been on and how he's been taken down this dark path, and you think about the weight that's been on Ikora, having to hold the Vanguard together, having Cade's voice of levity and brightness that he brings uh, to that group, that I think is gonna be great for them. Well, at least we have each other. We want people to take away that sense of reunion and that, that idea of like the, the gang being back mm -hmm. together for this moment. I'm here now, wherever the hell here is. The witness poses a dire threat. And the Witch Queen holds the answers we seek. But only if we contend with her sister, Zivu Araf. It rests with me. Will you come back from this? Do not be afraid. Magic and have entwined it with your light. Assault the spire, Guardian, and open the way to our tithes. Let them know fear. The deck of whispers, and they do whisper. Fight in my name, Guardian. Every opponent you defeat strengthens me. My appetite rises for your brutal tributes. Let us show her what it is to be hive. of the greatest death I can bestow. Season of the Witch is our opportunity as players. We've been annihilating and breaking Hive spells, and now we finally get to cast them. At the end of Season of the Deep, we learn that Savathun has the key to getting into the portal that we need to go into. That means we have to go find Imaru, her ghost. Imaru's like, not so fast. We've got a bigger problem first, and that bigger problem's name is Zivu Arath. If we fight her, she only gets stronger. Eris has an idea. It's a really... It's a really good It's idea. a wild-ass idea, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she determines, like, well, the best way to fight fire is with fire. We are channeling all of that energy that we're creating by going through, by eliminating enemies, and we're tithing to our friend Eris. Bring me your tithes. What does that mean for the characters and the player to kind of, like, be like Sabathun? And that's where we went down the path of having Hive Eris. We want to extend that magical fantasy into the player then, that ability to have overwhelming magical power, that risk and reward into all of our activities and systems experiences. And so that's what led us to come up with things like Deck of Whispers. It's this magical deck of cards that creates amazing synergies with your build craft meta and with buffs and the activities. And they can then choose these cards at will, whichever ones they want, and then that really leans into the build crafting. You actually are getting cards that you can then use to place on the battlefield and change the way you play. I am such a sucker for deck building. Like, being able to like bring that element into Destiny gameplay has just been like, oh, chess yeah, oh, it's really fun. fun. <laughs> 
So we've got two brand new seasonal activities coming with Season of the Witch. We've got Altars of Summoning and Sabbathoon Spire. Sabbathoon Spire is our new three player offensive. You're doing a lot more with Lucent Hive Magic, but it's got a high amount of combatant density. It's got additional random encounters that you can come across. The Witch's Spire itself, Sabbathoon Spire, was like her reliquary for all these different magical experiments as she was learning the light. You're there in order to learn as much as you can in order to become a master spellcaster, right? To become like Savathun. The Altar of Summonings activity is really exciting because you can spend like 20 minutes in it or you can spend two hours in it. It's a three player experience that you can hop in and hop out of. As you're going through this activity, you're filling the tithing bucket. As that tithing bucket is filled up, you'll get progressively more rewards. And then finally at the end, it'll cash out and you'll get a whole mess of rewards. We really wanted to make sure that there was a home for any exotic mission content coming in seasons uh, after the year has passed. And so we developed what we're calling the exotic mission rotator. Right away, we're getting Presage, Vox Obscura, and Operation Seraph Shield. This is some of the most fun content the team has making. It's some of the content the fans and players of Destiny love the most. The most exciting thing, outside of just the missions themselves, is that every time we put a mission inside of that rotator, the exotic that comes alongside of it will become craftable. With Season of the Witch, we have a brand new Vex uh, lo-fi PvP map coming. It's really exciting. It's got a bunch of uh, really tight gameplay experiences. We wanted to make sure that we focused the combat a little bit more. With the new Vex network map, we really wanted to make sure we hit. It's like, hey, you're shoulder to shoulder more often. There's not as much deep sight lines that you're interacting with. And a lot of the flow of the map is actually built around this like kind of central pillar of the Vex network that you're, you're orienting around. And there's also some modes coming to you, right? We've got a new PvP game mode coming that's all about relics. It's about multiple relics, so it's not just one like the Scorch game mode from the past. So we've got the shield coming from Vault of Glass, we've got the spear back from Season of the Risen. And we've got the scythe from Season of the Haunted. Yeah, so you're gonna be reaping guardians with that thing. It's a lot more tactical gameplay. It's all about running around the map, claiming these relic dispensers, and then grabbing them in order to uh, push for victory. I will take what I need. The words in my throat are the weapon in my fist. We were feeling pretty hypey this season, obviously. There's something in the air. And so when thinking about like, what's a good raid reprisal that would really suit uh, this very hypey season? There's only one answer. Heading into the final shape, we really want to rally all Guardians at the end of the Light and Darkness Saga. We want to reduce those power barriers as well as catch people up on key story beats and make sure that they have a really great and easy time connecting with other players. In the final shape, we're trying to find ways to make power more simple and easy to understand and also lowering the barrier to entry. It's gonna make it easier for players who have not been able to jump into the game easily because they were held back by the challenges in grinding for the power levels that are required by these different activities. One of the major changes that's gonna be happening starting with the final shape is there are going to be a certain number of activities that are going to be power fixed. So it doesn't matter kind of what power level you are going into it, you're always going to be able to approach it. There's still going to be tiers of difficulty that you can do, things that are just meant to be experienced a certain way. Things like Nightfall strikes. 
that will still have power enabled. And that's where we're really gonna focus the whole power climb. The raids, the contest modes that everybody loves to engage with, that experience is fundamentally going to be staying the same. I'm excited for this because I think there will be a lot more clarity for players in terms of understanding the relative difficulty of things, where they sit now in the spectrum. One way that we're trying to do that is making it easier for new players to engage with you. So we're introducing something that we're calling Fire Team Power. You can actually bring your friends along to play any dungeons and raids in the game without having to wait them to be at a certain power level. The person with the highest power in your fire team is actually going to bring all the others close to their power level, which means that there's no barriers really for any other guardian to join you in this high level content. When it's combined with Fire Team Finder, it also allows you to find strangers, people you've never played with before, and have that same experience. That's all regardless of the power level of you and the rest of the people in your fire team. Fire Team Finder is the new feature that's coming in season 23, aimed at helping connect and find other people to complete the best and most aspirational content in Destiny. We have a tag system that allows players to be able to say, well, this is my play style. I'm really chill. I'm anti-sweat. I'm just really here to have it's a good time. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Tags really allows players to show a little bit more personality, show a little bit more about what they're about. I think what's really great about it is with this launch, we're also looking at including inclusion tags. As an example, one of the inclusion tags that we have are for colorblind players. Hopefully the inclusion tags will bring players closer to finding their community and, and even closer to the people that they're playing with. So once a listing goes live, players will be put into a listing lobby where players can gather, they can communicate with each other. So we wanted to make it as convenient and as easy as possible for players to not just sit and stare at a screen for a long time while their listing actually fills up. As a gamer who's typically more solo, I'm especially excited about this because it really is about helping reduce that anxiety and burden that comes with trying to make a new connection. The feature coming out today that I'm incredibly excited about is Timeline Reflections. Essentially what we have done is we went back to previous expansions and pulled out missions that we felt really represent key narrative beats within our story. We are going to have a mission for Forsaken, mission for Beyond Light, as well as a mission for Witch Queen. Thanks for the memories, Guardian. The neat thing about these missions is they're not going to be like one-to-one -one for how you would experience them in the campaign. You're also going to get additional pieces of narrative fed to you to like identify like, hey, this is why it's important that this happened, and here are the people you met along the way. A really big one that's really timely for Final Shape is Kay's Last Stand from Forsaken. This is a moment that a lot of players, new and old, are gonna come back to Destiny. I think this is just the right time to introduce features that are gonna allow those players to jump right in and find people to play with and enjoy this content regardless of their power level. We're reaching the end of this 10-year this journey. What comes next? The episodes yeah. and the new way we're gonna tell stories moving forward. What's really important about episodes is that it's a really big shakeup to what we've been doing. Instead of providing four seasons a year, you are going to get three larger episodes. And so the first three episodes in this coming year are called Echoes, Revenant, and Heresy. It's coming right after the final shape. And the theme for the year is gonna be all about the consequences and aftermath of the final shape. I think what's really the cornerstone of the episode model that we're building is the three act structure. The acts act as these anchors for us to introduce new weapons, new artifact mods, new activities. There's gonna be new missions coming around the core. There'll be new story moments in every single one of these acts. We're actually providing more cinematic styled experiences throughout the final shape year and the episodes with it than any of the seasons we've ever developed before. These new stories are actually playable as standalone. Like each episode is something you can experience whether you've been playing Destiny for 10 years or this is your first one you're gonna be able to basically enjoy them in any order you want to. I think the opportunity with this big epic moment is that we get to innovate the game. We get to move the game forward. It's all about change frequently. It's all about deeper story moments. It's all about more weapons, more loot, more often. And it really provides the team with a platform to go much deeper into the themes and fantasies and story of any individual episode as compared to the seasons you know of today. 
I'm so excited to see what the narrative team can do with this kind of new platform of storytelling. Episodes provides this awesome foundation for the future of Destiny. We're moving into the next stage of Destiny 2. I think some people look at the final shape and they think Destiny 2 is coming to the end. And in many ways, it's the opposite. We're leaning in, we're putting the pedal to the metal. Episodes provide us a new, innovative way for players to engage with Destiny 2 throughout the year. What makes a guardian a guardian? Devotion, bravery, sacrifice. We know that we were chosen for a reason, by something greater than ourselves. Guardian. Guardian? Eyes up, Guardian. Shaped by the fires of each new battle, we are forged and sharpened into what we must become for the fight ahead. We are the final line that halts the second collapse. All of us, every Titan, every warlock, every hunter. What is it the Guardians say? Devotion inspires bravery. Bravery inspires sacrifice. Sacrifice leads to death. The line between light and dark is so very thin. Let's cross it together. There are things out in the dark that only the dark can overcome. Trust me. You've heard the stories of the Traveler's sacrifice. Of darkness descending upon humanity. It's gonna be an exciting year for Guardians. We get to make good on a promise that we made way back in 2014. There was classic rock blasting, a fire team racing across our solar system, and at the end, a simple message. Become legend. Today, you got a glimpse at how we'll be cementing your legend in this upcoming year. We're gonna be heading inside the Traveler, experiencing a destination unlike anything we've ever built before. We'll face the biggest bad we've ever made, and we'll do this all alongside a streamlined progression system, allowing us to easily play with friends in any content in the game. And as the dust settles in the final shape, we're gonna continue our legends in Echoes. It's Destiny's first episode in a new phase of storytelling for Guardians with brand new conflicts born from the resolution of the Light and Darkness saga. These first episodes or just the beginning. But if you're chomping at the bit to see how the Light and Darkness Saga is gonna kick off the future of Destiny 2, we've got a ton of great content for you to jump into today. Going live after this, we've got Season of the Witch with a new story, new weapons, new armor, new activities, and new PvP content, all alongside a series of story catch-up missions, allowing any of your friends to jump into the game and get up to speed on what's happening in this world. Then, next week, a brutal reprisal of Crota's End is going to join the ranks of our aspirational content. I can't wait to see you all in the throne world as we learn more about the final shape and how we can stop it.
This fight might be our last. So I'm asking you to rise one last time. When we create a collector's edition, we try and recreate items from the universe for players to enjoy outside of the game. So this year we're doing a Destiny 1 tower. We really try to work hard at thinking about 10 years of Destiny and how best to encapsulate that experience. Even as the game dev who've you know, worked on it since day one, like I think having it be the tower is super exciting for us because it's going to kind of catalog your journey of a player from when you first started playing Destiny all the way to now. The tower, it's kind of like the beacon in which you're, you're a place you can call home. You get the tower and then there are actual figures of the Vanguard mentors that accompany that architectural model. There's a lot of like hidden messages and hidden things. There's uh, gonna be some fun surprises. We're always trying to push the envelope. And so we've been playing a lot with magnetic locks and uh, sound effects, yeah. and lights, just sort of make this experience as a whole yeah. um, really special. It's sort of the perfect symbol of Destiny. I'm so excited for it. <laughs> Me too.